today, it's common to refer collectively to Norway, Denmark, Sweden, Finland, and even Iceland as the Scandinavian countries. Norway, Denmark, and Sweden are often referred to simply as Scandinavia for historians, echoing a time when the three kingdoms were joined as one under the Kalmar Union. Even after the Union's collapse, Denmark and Norway remained interlocked for some time, followed by a similar union between Sweden and Norway. Despite each having their own cultures and people, and now being entirely independent of each other, these three Nordic nations in particular have a curiously intertwined history. But why exactly did they end up united? What happens to the Kalmar Union that would eventually be seceded by Denmark-Norway? And why would Denmark-Norway eventually collapse? Under threat from the growing dominance of the German Hanseatic League, the Scandinavian countries of not just Denmark and Norway, but also Sweden, which included much of modern-day Finland, first began to throw around the idea of a union. The goal was to combat the influence and expansion of the Germans, and the thought was that a unified Scandinavia would be much more successful at balancing the scales. At this point, though, the idea didn't have a very strong backing, and many were worried about how it would affect their own country in one way or another. This, nevertheless, would shortly become irrelevant when the daughter of Denmark's king, Margaret, was wed to King Haakon VI of Norway and Sweden. Margaret's brother would die, leaving Denmark with no male heir, giving her the chance to propose her son, Olaf, as the replacement upon her father's death. She also declared that he be the true heir to the throne in Sweden, even after the ousting of Haakon from the Swedish throne not long before. Furthermore, when King Haakon died in 1380, Olaf would take the crown in Norway, and it appeared that this was the chance they had all waited for to unite the three kingdoms together and finally push back against the Hanseatic League. Less than a decade later, though, Olaf tragically passed away at only 16 years old, leaving the thrones empty and hopes of a union dashed. But Margaret would shortly save the day when she was declared the new rightful ruler in both Denmark and Norway. And soon, the contemporary King of Sweden, who had so far been occupying the throne that the now queen felt Olaf had been destined for, got himself deposed by the Swedish nobility with Margaret's help. As a result, she was granted authority in the ousted monarch's place, at long last uniting the Scandinavian kingdoms under a single ruler. In 1396, the union became official with the publication of the Kalmar Treaty. Though each state would maintain control over its own domestic policies, foreign affairs, and economy were all overseen by the monarchy. Still, this left a certain level of autonomy within the Union, and each nation remained somewhat independent while still ruled by the same crown. It seemed like a solid plan, and for a while, it worked. The Kalmar Union lasted for over a century, but just as had been the case before its formation, there were still many Scandinavians who were against the Union's existence. And in Sweden, there were far too many things to continue as they were. The Kalmar Union suffered a bloody collapse in the 16th century. After the crowning of Christian II as Sweden's king in 1520, though he had to take military action to claim the throne of the third part of the Union, a conspiracy between the monarch and Archbishop Gustav Trolle led to the massacre of 82 Swedish nobles believed to be potential rivals of the king in a span of only two days. It was insisted that these men had been executed for heresy, but by this point, Sweden had had just about enough of the Kalmar Union, and no amount of lies were going to change that. Following a revolt led by Gustav Vasa, the son of one of the executed nobles, Christian was ousted from the throne of Sweden in 1521, and by 1523, Vasa had become the nation's new king, and officially severed Sweden's ties with the Kalmar Union. Norway, too, would try to break free shortly after, but Denmark's superior military put a stop to that quite quickly. 
But as we know now, Denmark-Norway would eventually split up. It seems that there are a few reasons why Denmark-Norway was destined for a breakup, with one leading factor likely being related to the plague of wars that the Union faced following the departure of Sweden. First came the Northern Seven Years' War, which was more or less pointless and triggered by generally petty excuses. When Denmark-Norway's King Christian III put the Swedish insignia on his coat of arms, Sweden's Erik XIV decided to respond by putting the Danish and Norwegian insignia on his own coat of arms, having viewed the acts of Christian as an attempt to claim ownership of Sweden. Tensions escalated from here until a full-blown war broke out in 1563. But when it ended seven years later, not much had been accomplished other than the loss of money and men. The next invasion came in 1611, when Denmark-Norway took the offensive against Sweden in the Kalmar War over trade and maritime disputes. This time, the war did secure some of Denmark-Norway's trade dominance, but it also gave Sweden a rare exemption to Denmark's sounds Jews toll, which made up nearly two-thirds of the nation's state income around this time. Wars were expensive, and so were toll exemptions, but Denmark-Norway wasn't ready to stop fighting. The mid-17th century saw the Union getting involved in the Protestant versus Catholic Thirty Years' War, although the Treaty of Lübeck would end Denmark-Norway's participation in 1629. Sweden, however, had done quite well in the Thirty Years' War, and the Swedes soon decided to push their luck by invading Denmark-Norway in 1643. The attack shined a light on not only the dwindling power of the Union, but also on the differing mentalities between Denmark and Norway. The latter was not very eager to go back to war, and in fact, it had mostly been the decisions of Denmark so far that it kept both in a constant conflict. And now, worn down by frequent clashes, Denmark and Norway were unable to take down their attacker, and when peace was made in 1645, both nations were forced to hand territory over to the Swedes. The Dano-Swedish War was another slap in the face for Denmark-Norway, who would end the war nearly half the size it was going into it, and the following Scanian War in 1675 turned out to be another useless waste of money and men. But it would be the effects of the Napoleonic War that would finally break the camel's back. For the first portion of the conflict, Denmark-Norway had managed to remain entirely neutral. But just to be safe, the Union decided to join the League of Arms Neutrality as an extra precaution, which instantly backfired. The Brits saw this as a threat of aggression and invaded Denmark-Norway, striking Copenhagen in 1801 and 1807, with the latter case seeing Denmark-Norway's entire naval fleet destroyed and in some cases incorporated into the British Royal Navy. Understandably, Denmark-Norway reacted by joining an alliance with France, although they weren't of much use given their complete lack of a workable navy. By the end, Denmark-Norway was forced to sign the Treaty of Kiel, which would require Denmark to hand over all of Norway to the Kingdom of Sweden, officially ending the centuries-old union. Norway would eventually declare independence, be forced into a union with Sweden, and then once more become fully independent by 1905, and never again would it be united with Denmark. But aside from back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back wars, what contributed to the end of Denmark-Norway? Why didn't Denmark fight to keep Norway? Well, first and foremost were the events of the Napoleonic War and subsequent treaty. Denmark wasn't really in a position to force Norway into remaining in the Union since they had to sign the agreement giving it up. And as Denmark had learned previously, war with Sweden would not be easy nor wise. Additionally, Denmark was not as dominant as it had once been, and Norway had, in fact, been growing stronger. It simply would have been too difficult and nonsensical to fight the separation. It seems that the Union was never meant to last after all.